So you'll notice on the, the screen that it's a little wavy at times. This is, let's say, by intention. This is good because I'm going to be talking about interference patterns. And one of the things that we're going to mention here is that the wave-like nature of quantum mechanics seems to collapse into a particle-like fashion when you pay attention. So if you pay very close attention to these screens, they should sharpen up. So I'm talking about entangled minds, and I'm going to address this in, in three ways. Uh, a mystery in physics, and then interpretations within physics, and then primarily talking about experiments, because that's what I'd like to do. I'm going to set my timer there. OK, so what's the mystery in physics? The mystery in physics, uh, Richard Feynman said, is impossible to explain in any classical way, and which has in it the heart of quantum mechanics in reality, contains the only mystery. The interpretations, you've probably all heard words like the many worlds hypothesis, decoherence, the Copenhagen interpretation, and then John von Neumann's interpretation. And then we're going to talk about some experiments that have looked at, at these issues. First, let's look at the mystery in a little bit more detail. The mystery is sometimes called a quantum measurement problem. I think of it more as quantum mechanics. Uh, and the idea is this, that uh, the cows will behave a certain way as long as nobody is looking, but as soon as somebody comes along, they start behaving like cows. <laughs> and then they stop behaving that way. So this is an observational effect in cows as well as elementary particles. And of course, it also raises the, uh, the specter of uh, particle wave duality. So we can see this if you were uh, hitting golf balls through a double slit, you would expect them to land in two stripes on the other side. And in fact, this is what happens with light or electrons as well, but only if you're watching. If you're not watching, you get the interference pattern. And you see the interference patterns on the screen there, so you're not watching close enough. It'll, it'll sharpen up. There we go. And the, the upshot of this is it, if the path is knowable, in this case with a double slit, then the photons will behave like particles. If it's unknowable, they behave like waves. So this is part of the quantum measurement problem. And ultimately, we're dealing with something about knowledge, information, observation, measurement. These are all semantically related. And what do we know uh, most intimately that is related to these questions? And the answer is that. As far as we know, uh, we, we are the system that gains knowledge, has information, observes, and so on. So going back now to interpretations, uh, because of this close relationship between observation and something to do with the mind, that uh, von Neumann, among others, said that consciousness so-called collapses the quantum wave function into a classical particle-like uh, aspect. And what's interesting is that basically all of the founders of quantum mechanics thought and wrote deeply about this issue, because it's one that still has not gone away. So this is roughly the 1920s, 1930s. We see the same discussions happening again with von Neumann, with Wigner, with Wheeler in about the 1950s, plus or minus a couple of years, and today. So Henry's in the audience over there. Minas is probably out there somewhere. So this is an ongoing question about how do we, what do we do with the role of the observer? At a meeting uh, of physicists and philosophers who are specifically interested in the ontological uh, foundations of quantum mechanics, they were asked this question, what's your opinion of the importance of the quantum measurement problem in understanding what's going on here? Uh, this happened to be 33 people, uh, and answers range from it's actually not a problem at all, it's a pseudo problem, or solved by decoherence, or it'll be solved in some other way. But almost a quarter of the people present said this is a severe difficulty. We really need to understand this in order to understand how to, what the ontological nature is that quantum mechanics is trying to tell us. Uh, an, another conference that happened a year later is called uh, Quantum Mechanics Without Observers. And this is for physicists who really, really don't want to have anything to do with psychology and, or observation or humans or consciousness or anything. And even in that conference, people are asked exactly the same questions, and you get about the same response. So this is not a tiny little minority of physicists. It's actually a, a reasonably large minority, and probably growing over time, to recognize that there's something strange about the observer. 
even philosophers, we all know uh, Dave Chalmers has said that faced with the hard problem of understanding qualia or subjectivity, we, not, we might need one or two ideas that seem crazy. So his crazy idea is the same as von Neumann's and others, that maybe consciousness is fundamental in some way. Well, let's now turn to experiments. Most of what I do and what we do at the Institute of Nautic Sciences is take theories like the one that, that uh, John was just talking about and figuring out a way of testing is that true or not. So we're testing the observer effect. If you change the way you look at things, do the things you look at change? Well, in a quantum mechanical sense, it's true. But what we're interested in is does pure subjectivity collapse a quantum wave function in a way that you can measure? We're talking about the Schrodinger's cat paradox. Before you observe, the cat is both dead and alive. And what we want to know is, can we select a preferred outcome of the cat by mental means alone? So we're going to ask somebody to prefer that outcome just through their mind, without actually looking at anything, just imagining that this is the case, and maybe the cat can live. But no cats were harmed in these experiments. <laughs> So instead of using a cat, the first, first experiment of this type, we used what's called a Michelson interferometer. And it's a very simple setup. You have a laser beam shooting through here. It hits a half-silvered mirror. So part of it goes through and part of it bounces off like this. And then it hits two solid mirrors. And you'll see from the side that the beam comes out and it creates an interference pattern. In this particular configuration, you get concentric circles. If there was no interference, you would get a uniform shape. There would be no, no circles inside it. So this is a convenient way of looking at the wave particle nature of light in an experimental context. And what we ask somebody to do is, first of all, we put the entire apparatus along with the camera to take pictures of the interference pattern. This is put into a sealed room. It's in, inside our electromagnetically shielded room at, at our laboratory. And we ask people on the outside of the room to imagine that they could put their mind inside the box in one of the arms of the interferometer and simply see the photons as they go past. And if they can do that, they would essentially be gaining which path information and collapse the wave function. That's what we would predict. So in this case, uh, we use both meditators and non-meditators. We use meditators because they have attention training. That's what meditation is all about. And so then they're able to follow instructions. The non-meditators try to follow instructions, but if we ask somebody to put your mind over there for a minute, they can do that for about eight seconds at maximum, sometimes two seconds. We know that because we measure their EEG, and we can see that, it, that inattention drops, or attention drops away in roughly three or four seconds even when you're trying. Meditators can sustain that much longer. So the, the task is very simple. We tell people where to put your mind and to gain knowledge. If somebody doesn't know how to see a photon in their mind's eye, then we say, well, just imagine that you could. And if they can't imagine that they could, then they have to go away. <laughs> so in all of these experimental setups, we want to make sure that we're not going to make a mistake. So we run the entire system where nobody's looking, just to see, is, is the operation working correctly? So the nature of the protocol is, for 30 seconds, put your mind in the box and where we told you to put it, and now for 30 seconds, take it out and rest. And now put it in and take it out, and take it in and out. So that we use a counterbalance method. When you do that and nobody's involved in it, you get a flat line. This is basically saying that the interference pattern does not change in these 30-second periods. But when you ask a person to do it, you get this upside down, this ripply curve upside down, which is actually what you'd predict if interference is collapsing. So by design in this experiment, we are looking for a curve that drops. And in this case, you can tell by the error bars that it's actually quite far away from the control. So we got something. So this shows the difference between the non-meditators and the meditators. We've seen this often enough now that we try to only recruit people who have some kind of meditation experience or are involved in some kind of profession that involves focused attention. So sometimes people who do intentional healing are really good at this, and sometimes creative artists or people who do highly focused work. Uh, if you have attention deficit disorder, then it doesn't work so good. On the other hand, the non-meditators sometimes can act as nice controls 
because there's, they're humans, and we want to know whether the human body interacts with this in some way. So it does look like it's a mental effect that's causing this. So if you want to know more about that, that uh, study, you can look in that paper. So after doing that study, we decided to take the next leap, which is to actually use a double slit system. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's a very simple setup, make a laser, neutral density filter, a double slit, and then a camera. And again, we asked people to imagine that you could see what's going on at the vicinity of the double slit and make your mind act as though it's a, de a detector. This is what it actually looks like. It's a, a machined aluminum box, which is optically sealed, and the laser's point, pointing out the, the back there. The double slit is in a metal slide inside the box and it uses a line camera to look at the interference pattern. So what the camera actually sees is this image on the top. This is showing the intensity of light. And so you get a very nice uh, interference pattern there. It shows the intensity is more in the center, of course. And on the bottom, you see the Fourier transform where we're looking at the power spectrum of that shape. And that gives us two primary peaks of interest. One is the double slits peak, which is the fast moving sine wave on the top, and then the single slit, which is the, the slower, well, you see back roughly a half of a sine wave there. So those two peaks are a convenient way of looking at whether or not we have interference or not. And the task is, put your eye in there for 30 seconds and then take it away for 30 seconds. And we're predicting that the double slit spectrum will go down. The power spectrum will go down in this process and the single spectrum will go up. So we look at the ratio of the two and it creates a nice lever arm to have a very sensitive measure of how much interference is going on. Or as, as I like to say it, how much double slittiness we have. So I'm skipping over uh, four pilot studies that we did and just looking at our first formal experiment where we predefined 50 sessions, 50 people, uh, and see what we get. And so the red dot, well, first of all, the white dot is control. This is without anybody present, running 50 sessions. And this is with people doing the task. So this was a quite good result, about a five sigma result for the physicists out there. And again, meditators did quite a bit better than non-meditators. So we see that again and again. We published this in physics essays uh, two years ago. Uh, every time we do this experiment, we can't quite believe it. So we keep doing it again and again to see, did that really happen? So this is their second formal experiment. Again, predefined how many sessions, how many people. Uh, we, we did another analysis here looking at time delays. And the reason we look at a time delay in the result is because we're asking people to shift attention. Put your attention over there and now take it away. Well, you can't do that in an instant. It takes a few seconds for your mind to shift. So we expected that there would be a slight delay in the results of the experiment. In fact, that's what you get. You get a delay in the result, which is really interesting because it, again, is a secondary way of saying what we're dealing with is something to do with the mind and not something to do with the hardware that we're testing. When you do the same thing for the control, it's uniformly not significant. And here, we're getting down to pretty interesting results. This is almost six sigma results now. I should mention here that when we do these experiments now, uh, initially in pilot tests, we, we draw people from wherever we can get them. We test them repeatedly, and then we select the ones who appear to have talent. Many are meditators. Some of them aren't meditators. They just can somehow do this. So by the time we get to these formal experiments, we're using people who have already demonstrated that they can do this particular task. They may not be able to do other tasks, but at least this one they can do. So it's a selective group of people doing this. And we published this last year in physics essays, and they have one or two additional papers which are in the pipeline at the moment. The other nice thing about using a double slit system is that you can model it very precisely mathematically using wave mechanics. So you model the system in this fashion, and then you can create equations which show the amount of intensity due to one slit, the other slit, and both slits together. And then you can compare your model against what we actually measure. And when you do that, you apply the model to the data and it allows you to see aspects of the system that you can't measure directly. And this is what I mean. That when you apply the model to the system, it shows that when people are relaxing and withdrawing their attention from the system, it is as though the light is symmetrical between the two slits. But when you ask them to now pay attention, to concentrate on the system, the amount of light going through the slits becomes asymmetric. 
And that's, what it, that's why the, the interference begins to collapse. Whether that is what is actually going on, we don't know, but it does allow a model to measure something that we could not measure directly. So we've taken the same system. This, by the way, is a continuous laser. It's producing trillions of photons per second, probably more than trillions. Uh, and we put it on the web because all of the studies I mentioned so far are all done in the laboratory, and we're always concerned about the possibility that the proximity of the human body to the interferometer is causing a difference. For example, if we ask people to concentrate on something, they might lean towards the box a little bit, even though it's two meters away, and maybe the box will raise a milli-degree. And, and interferometers are notoriously very sensitive, and so we want to avoid that. So we have the entire experiment over the web. The closest anybody can get to this is about one kilometer, and the farthest is 18,000 kilometers. So we're pretty sure then that if they lean towards our way, it's not going to make much of a difference. So there's the interferometer. Uh, these, are, these dots show where on Earth people have done the experiment. Um, as you see, our laboratory is approximately there, and the farthest away you can get from us in Petaluma is South Africa. That's 18,000 kilometers as the crow flies. So we want to first of all see, can people do this task remotely? And also, is there an effective distance? Does this drop off with one over R squared or something like that? Uh, we have to date about 5,000 sessions run by humans and 7,000 sessions run by a Linux box, which is programmed to act like a human. And so this is, provides a very nice way of doing a, a control test because as far as the interferometer is concerned, every so often it knows somebody wants data. And the interferometer is on all the time. It's just waiting to give data. If a human asks for data, it starts serving it real time. So they get real time feedback. If it's a Linux box, it does exactly the same thing. It doesn't care. It doesn't know who's asking for data. So we get a very nice control to compare against humans. So they're serving to humans. They're serving to controls. What the humans see on the screen are either a blank screen, or like a graph, and this is their instruction to relax and withdraw their mind, or they see a graph, and they're told to mentally try to make the graph go up. If they do that, that is actually by the form of our feedback, it means that the wave function is collapsing. We have a mathematical way of connecting the two. So you don't have to think of this so much as your mind leaping through space as simply having a, a, a an association through feedback which connects you to the system. So it's more of a semantic or a psychological connection to the system than one that we can think of as physical, although there might be a physical connection as well. So this is what the camera sees in this case. Uh, what we're interested in measuring is a very simple measure. We, we are no longer looking at the, the Fourier transform, but we're just looking at a measure called fringe visibility, which tells you how sharp the fringes are. And it, there's the equation on the bottom. It's looking at the, the peak and the trough of a, adjacent fringes. And as the interference pattern collapses, that value will begin to decline. So we're looking at 20 fringes in the middle of this interference pattern. So what do you get? You get fringe visibility declining when the mind is focusing on the double slit. And this, again, is a, a differential measure. This is measuring. What happens when people are asked to pay attention to the system versus when they're not paying attention to it? One session in this experiment lasts 11 minutes. So over 11 minutes, there are 21 periods where you're shifting back and forth between paying attention and not paying attention. What you're looking at on the screen now is a differential measure. So it is dropping. Fringe visibility drops, and it drops pretty interestingly. All of the fringes drop, some of which are very significant. What happens when the Linux box looks at the system? Nothing. So we have a pretty good sense here of uh, something about humans paying attention to the system, even from very far distances, makes a difference. When you look then at the next question of, is there an effect of distance, the answer is no. The way to look at it is you do, you first of all create a, a result for each session, an effect size, and now you plot it along the distance away from the laboratory. And you look at the slope of the line. The slope of the line in our case is zero to six decimal places. It's really, really flat. So there's no effective distance at all. What we've been doing over the past year or so is now doing the same experiment using single photons. 
And this came about because one of the criticisms of what we've done so far is you're dealing with trillions upon trillions of photons per second. Maybe what you're looking at is quantum and maybe not. Maybe you're dealing with something else. You're interfering with the electronics in the system or something of that sort. Well, now we're using single photons. So the, the measure is a quanta in each case. And we're counting the number of quanta that, that hit the photomultiplier tube in a double slit system. Uh, the way it works is, on the far left side of that tube there, you have a very tiny bulb, and the bulb goes through a very thick filter. And you can calculate when it goes to the photomultiplier at the end that there's roughly somewhere between 100 and 1,000 photons per second in the box. But because the box is a, is a meter long, you can calculate how many photons are likely to be in the box at any given time, and the answer is it's extremely unlikely that that is the case. Also, the photomultiplier gives you a count. How many does it see per second? We set it up so it sees about 50 photons per second. Oh, it's also the whole thing sitting on top of a vibration isolation system to make sure that we're not, and the whole thing, by the way, is inside our shielded room. So external electromagnetics are gone, vibration is gone, it's quite nice. When we can check to make sure that we actually do get interference patterns, one photon at a time, and you get very tight error bars in this, so it's a very nice system. And the task is simple. You ask somebody to pay attention to the double slit inside the box. In this case, we're going to point the, photo, the photomultiplier tube at a fringe minimum. So if we destroy interference, that minimum count rate will go up. And that's, that's the design then. So in this case, rather than seeing a collapse of something, we're actually expecting to see a photon count go up. Because we're interested in what amounts to a mind-matter interaction, we're looking both at the, at the matter side, looking at photons, and on the mind side, we take EEG to give us a neuroscience reflection of what's going on in the people's minds. You notice how happy everyone is? This is partially to do an advertisement for uh, electrical geodesics because the, the sensor net that they use has little sponges. You don't, it's very easy to put on and the sponges are nice and cool. So you put the, the net goes on very quickly and then it feels nice. It feels like you're getting a little head massage and it's nice and cool. So there's like, you have two minutes when they're happy, that's when I take the picture. <laughs> so this is, I'm skipping over a lot of details here, but the, the, the upshot is this. So when you ask people to concentrate, Sure enough, the, the double slit count goes up. Uh, when you look at their EEG power, this, we did look at this, we're, we're looking essentially here at desynchronization. This happens to be alpha desynchronization, which is a way of measuring whether people are concentrating or not. So the moment you're asked to concentrate on something, if you happen to me be measuring your brain, your alpha would desynchronize. Actually, other frequencies desynchronize as well. So we could tell people concentrated, the double slit count went up but they weren't able to concentrate for very long, just for a couple of seconds, and then the double slit count goes down. So the correlation is quite nice. Uh, because we ran 20 participants in this, what we're showing here is that the double slit count goes up as gamma frequencies, the pow gamma power in your brain goes down, primarily in the temporal lobes, a little bit in the central, but right temporal. And we see again and again that something about the right side of the brain seems to be more associated with these kinds of tasks and other parts. So this is similar to what we saw with alpha. The decrease in alpha indicating attention, we see the same in gamma. So now I'll switch gears a little bit. What we're talking about so far is mind-matter interaction from one person and one device. Last year at SAND, I talked about our experiment at Burning Man where we're talking about many minds and many devices. And so th this is a very fast recapitulation of that. So Burning Man last year looked like this, the, burning, the man himself on a big UFO structure. That's what it looked like when the, it was burned. It was a nice event. And we had six random number generators on the playa. And we looked at the cross correlations and the outputs of the random generators and found a whoppingly significant result right at the time when the ceremony began. So the nice thing about this is that this is more or less repeatable. You get an event that's big enough and a lot of people are paying attention, you see changes in entropy. What you can't tell is what happened inside the random number generator because the generators are designed by, by design to be a black box that are simply pumping out bits and you don't get to see what's happening inside. 
So at this year's Burning Man, there's part of the crew, people dress in funny costumes. Uh, at this year, we designed our own new type of random number generator. We call it a quantum noise generator. This actually is producing noise coming out of electrons tunneling through a diode. So it's using shot noise, which is a quantum effect. And instead of using it to produce bits, we record the noise itself. So we're recording the noise at 44 kilohertz. This would not have been possible some years ago because this produces a huge amount of data, as you can imagine. Uh, but nevertheless, with a, with a 32 gig uh, SD card, you can record this, these devices very nicely. So we had 10 of them going. Uh, during the temple burn. So the temple is the second major event at the Burning Man. That's what it looks like from a distance. That's what it looks like uh, at night. And this is what it looks like when it's burning. So what happened uh, during the temple burn? This is before the burn. This is during the burn. That's after the burn. We get the same kind of result we saw before. In this case, the probability of this effect happening when we expected it to is very, very low. So we saw a similar effect. What we're looking at here is not bits. We're looking at the change in the phase of the noise. And I'm not looking at the, the power of the noise because each device might actually produce a slightly different amount of noise, but the phase is not affected by the amount of power. So we're seeing here a cross-correlation rise in the phase of the noise itself. So this is a more fundamental way of seeing what's happening and this, we think, is what's giving rise to why random bits also become coherent. So what have we learned? We've learned that uh, von Neumann, Chalmers, Henry Stapp, et cetera, may be on to something, that sometimes crazy ideas are correct. I have to, have to thank my, uh, my research team. The, these studies are not done by me, uh, but by a whole bunch of us. Uh, some of whom are in this audience, uh, both theoretical physicists and some engineers who helped us, uh, and our funders. There was a number of different funders who have funded this work. And, and now for a, sh a shameless uh, advertisement. Uh, I, I wrote about this topic of entangled minds now about eight years ago. Uh, so that book is still available. And before that, I wrote a book uh, called The Conscious Universe, the same title as uh, the, the book by Minas. Uh, unbeknownst to both of us. Um, he's taking a physics angle and I was taking the angle of uh, what do we know about science and psychic phenomena. And my latest book, which came out last year, is number one bestseller in religious history, which I find to be bizarre because I know very little about religion and almost nothing about history. But nevertheless, that's the way that Amazon uh, categorized it. So at least in one area, it's number one. And with that, I thank you for your kind attention.